Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Asthma Grand Rounds. I'm Chris Fanta, and it's my pleasure to welcome you by live webcasting, as all the audience is today, uh, to our uh, presentation on the role of inhaled steroids alone in the treatment of asthma. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Nancy Lang, who's a member of our Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Division here at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's a member of our Severe Asthma Program and uh, Associate Director of the Pulmonary Function Laboratory. And um, we um, would like to welcome your participation, even at a distance. If you have comments, if you have questions, please just submit them, text them to the number shown here on the screen. at 617-513-6043. And uh, at the end, we'd love to hear your thoughts and comments or any questions that you might have. And uh, we are offering CME credit. All you have to do is send your name, your degree, and the e your email address to cfant at partners.org. I'll forward them to Harvard Medical School, and we're pleased to award CME credit for your participation today. Because this is the last uh, asthma grand rounds for this academic year, I thought I'd take just one minute to uh, let you know about next year's program, because I'm excited by it, and I, I hope you are too. We have a series of five presentations. You can see them here. We're going to talk about bronchial thermoplasty for asthma. Uh, uh, so not quite pro-con, but a balanced view uh, discussing its utilization. We're going to talk about the uh, role of the epithelium and, and epithelial cell reprogramming in this context of type 2 airway inflammation. Dr. Nora Barrett will present that research. We'll have a clinical discussion a panel discussion on managing uh, severe asthma in children representing uh, 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 Mass General Children's Hospital Brigham participation. It'll be a great interaction. And then we're pleased to have Michelle Cloutier, who's the um, director of the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program expert panel four, I guess it is going to be, uh, who is developing the new guidelines for the NAEPP. Uh, and by um, March, we believe they will be officially released, and we're delighted to have her discussing them. And finally, we'll welcome back a graduate of the Harvard uh, training program, Sunita Sharma, who's now in uh, Colorado, who will talk about the intrauterine exposures and the origins of asthma. So an exciting program uh, ahead. Today we have a pro-con debate on the uh, argument there is no longer a role for inhaled steroids alone in the treatment of asthma, persistent asthma. And I'm going to begin uh, with ne neither speaker has any conflicts to d disclose. And I'm going to begin uh, uh, arguing that there is no longer a role for inhaled corticosteroids alone and uh, begin with this quote, which Mark Anthony surely did not say in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, but I'm paraphrasing, I come not to bury inhaled corticosteroids, but to praise them. I think that inhaled steroids are the foundation of our treatment of all patients with persistent asthma. There are lots of studies one could quote about the benefits in terms, for instance, of preventing exacerbations. Here I wanted to show data about the risk of exacerbations of asthma leading to death from asthma and the efficacy of use of inhaled corticosteroids in reducing that risk. This was data collected in the province of Saskatchewan in Canada where detailed uh, medical records, insurance records were available. Researchers uh, identified uh, approximately 70 patients who had died of uh, asthma and had matched controls, over 2,000 controls, and looked at the prescriptions uh, filled for inhaled corticosteroids in the year prior to death or prior to identifying this uh, 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 control patient. And there was a 20, there was a dose response relationship, inverse dose response relationship between the use of inhaled corticosteroids and the risk of a severe asthma attack leading to death with, with each canister being filled at 21% reduction in mortality. And 
As you know, mortality is sort of the tip of the iceberg of severe asthma attacks, and this could be applied in general to reduction in attacks leading to hospitalization and emergency room. And uh, I would argue that the success that we have seen in the United States in terms of decreased uh, uh, um, morbidity and mortality from asthma over the last uh, a decade or two is attributable to the widespread utilization, I believe, of inhaled corticosteroids. I just would comment that when I was a pulmonary fellow in training and the data would be released annually about mortality due to asthma, every year there was seemed to be an increase, a rise in mortality. We were doing something wrong, and I it was puzzling and frustrating to see, and I thought, gosh, I, I was adjusting the theophylline level just as well as I could do it, and yet still uh, uh, increased mortality. And it was 1990, it was in the uh, late 80s, I guess, that recognition was made about the role of chronic eosinophilic inflammation uh, as the foundation of pathobiology of asthma, and uh, in 1990, the first expert panel of the National Asthma Education Prevention Program suggested maybe instead of adding another bronchodilator theophylline to our treatment of our patients, we should uh, treat with inhaled corticosteroids for persistent asthma. And I would say that the widespread adoption of those guidelines, widespread use of inhaled steroids, is probably a major factor that led to this subsequent and sustained decline in asthma mortality and hospitalizations um, despite the uh, persistent high prevalence of disease. And so it is that our standard of practice has been since uh, here are the 2007 guidelines and the step care approach that many of you are familiar with, that after a patient uh, needs is treating with a uh, short-acting beta agonist bronchodilator and needs therapy stepped up, it's recommended that they use low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. In fine print are the alternatives, chromalin, nidocromil, and theophylline. Those have gone by the wayside, fortunately. And I'm not so sure that that is still the appropriate treatment for our patient who has developed mild, persistent asthma and needs to step up therapy. And that's what I'd like to debate or discuss today. So let's think about a case example. I saw this patient, uh, uh, it's about three weeks ago now. And uh, you, you've seen, if not this patient, a very similar patient many, many times in your practice. A 25-year-old woman with, uh, uh, with uh, or for evaluation of asthma. Sorry about the typo. So she had the onset of symptoms as a teenager. She was treating uh, with albuterol as needed. And she had recently moved back from Florida to New England. She was living with her parents who have uh, two cats. And she uh, reported typical symptoms, cough, wheeze, shortness of breath, along with upper airway uh, symptoms of sneezing and rhinitis. And now she said uh, she's using her albuterol inhaler four to six times a day, plus she has uh, antihistamine for control of upper airway symptoms. She doesn't re report anosmia. She has no history of aspirin intolerance. She has a positive family history for asthma. And because this was fairly recent, uh, I wasn't able to measure lung function um, this was a virtual visit, but for the sake of argument, would you humor me and say that she had mild airflow obstruction, 85%. She, I believe, fits in this category of mild persistent asthma. She has poorly controlled asthma on frequent use uh, of an inhaled beta agonist, and she needs additional therapy, step-up care. And should we begin an inhaled corticosteroid? This has been standard of practice for now many years, as we've said. Um, and I think it's quite likely that if, uh, for many visits, she would go home with two inhalers, her short-acting beta agonist and her new uh, steroid inhaler to be taken once or twice daily. And I think uh, there are disadvantages to this approach that has been our 
bedrock of uh, stepped care for a number of years. One is that she'll go home with this new therapy that you, uh, we've recommended and find it doesn't make her feel better. The albuterol gave her instant relief. This new inhaler seems like a bust. Two puffs, no different. Morning, evening, no different. Maybe if she sustains its use consistently for a period of a couple of weeks or more, she'll begin to notice the benefit, but she may give up on it, and this impairs, you know, this lack of immediate benefit discourages adherence, and adherence is a big deal, as you know, in management of this chronic illness. Uh, in a big literature review a few years ago, depending on how you assess adherence, uh, consistent use over the course of months was of inhaled steroids was anywhere from 22 to 63%, uh, generally poor. And in this review, they said 24% uh, of asthma exacerbations, we believe, uh, could have been prevented if patients had used their inhaled steroids. 60% of asthma-related hospitalizations were attributed to poor adherence. Um, and one of the reasons, I think, for poor adherence is it doesn't make you feel better. You get no immediate benefit. They reported, although I didn't remember seeing uh, detailed numbers, that uh, use of a combination inhaled steroid with a long-acting beta agonist that provided uh, immediate bronchodilator benefit led to improved adherence, but there was little data to support that. Disadvantage number two now she's gone home with two different inhalers, and maybe she'll get confused about which one is I'm supposed to use as needed, which one I'm supposed to use regularly. I was going to say, have you ever encountered that? Of course, you have many, many times. And uh, I would point out the, the curious fact that the instructions for use were on the box uh, when she purchased them. The box has long been thrown out. These inhalers have no label with instructions. You're hoping she remembers, in this case, that the red-brown one, she's supposed to take two puffs twice a day, the other one as needed, but the potential for confusion is great. And I'd like to come back uh, at the end of my talk to the possibility that we'd use one inhaler for both purposes. The uh, third disadvantage is, yes, uh, eosinophilic, chronic eosinophilic inflammation is the foundation of much of our asthma, but not all asthma seems to be eosinophilic. And what about the role of inhaled steroids for non-eosinophilic asthma? And you may have seen this uh, paper in the New England Journal of Medicine from AsthmaNet and Dr. Elliot Israel and Wanda Fipatanikal, uh, both uh, participants in this AsthmaNet. Uh, and uh, they looked at patients with non-eosinophilic asthma and asked what's the benefit of inhaled corticosteroids. They had a significant, you know, nearly 300 patients. Just the group that I want to address, mild persistent asthma. They had been off inhaled steroids for three weeks and then remained off during a six weeks run-in period where they had induced sputum on two occasions, looking at sputum eosinophilia uh, and identifying a group of patients who had uh, fewer than 2% eosinophils in their sputum on both occasions and were thought, therefore, to have non-eosinophilic mild asthma. They needed step-up therapy, so one group was randomized to an inhaled steroid, mometasone, the other to a long-acting bronchodilator, and they chose teotropium because they were concerned about a long-acting beta agonist alone uh, as a uh, bronchodilator. Uh, so teotropium was given, or placebo. They were on uh, therapy, one or the other or the third, for 12 weeks block, 12 week blocks in randomized order. And then there was this sort of hierarchical assessment of which period they seemed better on. Inhale, or was it with the steroid, placebo, or bronchodilator based on... Um, treatment failures, asthma control days, lung function measurements. And interestingly, in this study, they thought that the majority of patients had non-eosinophilic asthma. At least they couldn't find 2% or more uh, uh, eosinophils on the sputum differential in the majority of these patients with mild uh, persistent asthma. And then how inhaled steroids work in that 
subgroup, non-eosinophilic asthma, no better than placebo. Here, here are the results. The number of patients who uh, seemed to do best on placebo compared to best on mometasone, there was absolutely no difference. There was a trend towards benefit from the bronchodilator. I felt better at fewer treatment failures, et cetera, when given uh, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. This difference was said to be non-significant on a two-tailed analysis, but if they looked just at adults, not adolescents, then they reached significance with the bronchodilator. And finally, uh, why not just inhale steroids? Uh, because we can do better. We have better therapies to offer that 20-odd-year-old uh, patient that I uh, presented at the beginning. And I, the argument is that inhaled steroids plus a long-acting bronchodilator in combination is more effective therapy than an inhaled steroid alone. And I'd like to begin that argument with patients with sort of were recruited with mild, moderate, and severe asthma. There were nearly 3,000 uh, uh, patients in this uh, trial, randomized double-blind over um, uh, half a year. They escalated therapy as necessary in order to achieve uh, good asthma control. One group escalating uh, inhaled steroid alone, fluticasone. The second group uh, escalating the dose of inhaled steroid in combination with uh, long-acting beta agonist salmeterol. And then over the uh, phase two of the study, the dose was maintained. The highest dose, uh, the dose required to achieve good control was sustained for the remainder of the time. And the benefits in terms of achieving good control are clearly uh, greater for the combination than inhaled corticosteroids alone. The time to achieving this control was quicker. The dose of inhaled corticosteroids was less. The benefits all seem to favor the combination. But is it safe? Uh, are the long-acting beta agonists safe, including in mild asthma? Would you give it to someone with mild asthma? And I think the answer now has been clearly proven, yes, safe. And this came, as you know, from this series of uh, FDA-mandated placebo-controlled trials comparing an inhaled corticosteroid alone versus an inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta agonist using uh, uh, different combinations. So there were four of these placebo-controlled trials, uh, uh, each with uh, 11,000 patients, and then they uh, duplicated it in children. So a huge number of patients looking for a signal in terms of risk of death, hospitalization, acute respiratory failure. And uh, here was the first reported uh, result uh, comparing fluticasone alone versus fluticasone plus salmeterol. Is there anything inherently dangerous about a long-acting beta agonist? We should stay away from it. And the answer was no. Uh, there were no increase in deaths. There were two intubations, but they were in the fluticasone alone group, not related to the uh, 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 long-acting beta agonists, and overall no difference in serious adverse events. And there were fewer exacerbations. The combination worked better. And so all 40,000 patients, uh, all studies, uh, all of these five studies found the same results. No increased risk, uh, but more effective when using the combination than an inhaled steroid alone. So yes, safe. But should we use it in mild asthma, mild persistent asthma, instead of just beginning an inhaled corticosteroid? Does it have that same applicability as it does in moderate and severe disease? Well, here's a trial. Fluticasone, 100 milligrams twice daily, low dose, versus low dose inhaled steroid plus uh, a long-acting beta agonist twice daily, and let's do it in patients with mild asthma. Randomized control, double blind, parallel group, half a year, 500 patients. Uh, and all of these patients entering the study were on just a short acting beta agonist. They all had an FEV1 greater than 80%. This is just the population we want to ask is there a role for inhaled steroids alone? 
They were symptomatic. They had persistent disease. They needed to step up care. And the benefits favored the combination. We're not surprised if we look at uh, lung function, the improvement in, in morning peak flow over the 24 weeks is greater, significantly greater, uh, when using a bronchodilator and an inhaled corticosteroid. And that was true, uh, the advantages for the morning peak flow, the evening peak flow, and it translated into symptom-free days uh, and rescue needing your uh, quick-acting bronchodilator uh, uh, free days. So uh, the advantage, even in mild per persistent asthma, favored the combination rather than an inhaled steroid alone. And this then was looked at not just in this one study, but a uh, you know, um, meta-analysis, a, a systematic review. And the question we're asking, the addition of long-acting beta agonists to inhaled steroids as first-line therapy for persistent asthma in steroid-naive adults and children. That's just what we're asking for my patient. Uh, uh, is there any advantage using the combination? So they, these authors uh, uh, found 24 randomized trials. They had mild and some had moderate airflow obstruction on a short-acting beta agonist alone, and they were randomized to either an inhaled steroid or an inhaled steroid and long-acting beta agonist with the inhaled steroid at exactly the same dose. And like that one study we looked at, the meta-analysis found uh, that the combination was favorable in terms of lung function, of course, because we're giving a bronchodilator, but also symptom score, nighttime symptoms, need for uh, short-acting beta agonists, rescue free days. Patients did better, uh, and there were no increased adverse events other than an increase in tremor, which I would think, if it were me, I would be happily put up with a tremor uh, for these symptomatic benefits. And that leads us uh, to the one other point that I wanted to make, which is this issue of uh, getting confused between two different inhalers, uh, your uh, uh, controller medication, use, I want you to use it regularly, your quick reliever, I want you to use it as needed. Is there any chance that we could achieve both functions with a single inhaler? And as you probably know, the answer uh, is yes, based on what has been called the smart therapy or single inhaler for maintenance and reliever therapy. And this works if you use as your long-acting beta agonist a quick onset beta agonist like Formoterol, which has an onset of action probably within a minute uh, of administration. So certainly as quick as albuterol. Quick relief, sustained relief, in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid when you're needing relief, would that work? And be safe if patients are allowed to use this combination, including a long-acting bronchodilator, as often as they need for quick relief. And they were allowed in these studies to use them up to 10 puffs per day. So huge study introduced this uh, SMART therapy 2,700 patients uh, of all ages, mild to moderate airflow obstruction. And it's, the doses are interesting. This is budesonide, uh, you know, uh, uh, two puffs twice a day from our high-dose um, uh, dry powder inhaler of budesonide. So high-dose inhaled steroid and use your short-acting beta agonist as needed, standard therapy. Or budesonide with formoterol, the combo, at a strikingly low dose. This is, in my mind, the pediatric dose, 80 micrograms of inhaled steroid uh, with uh, 4.5 micrograms of formoterol. One puff twice a day, but take it every day. This is your maintenance, and use your quick-acting bronchodilator as needed. That was group two. And group three... Uh, same low-dose inhaled steroid combined with the uh, long-acting beta agonist, the budesonide for motor oil combination. Use it twice daily every day, and that's the only inhaler you need. If you need quick relief, use that one. It'll work quickly. It'll last a long time. 
and um, you can use it as often as 10 puffs a day. How did that strategy work? A single inhaler for both control and relief. It worked very well. Here is the um, primary outcome that they were looking at, the risk of severe exacerbations. You can see in the single inhaler, low-dose inhaled corticosteroid, used also for quick relief because of the quick onset of the long-acting beta agonist, had fewer exacerbations over the course of a year than the other uh, two strategies. Uh, in addition, here's a lung function. Uh, the solid line here is that maintenance and relief in a single inhaler device. Lung function seemed best when uh, using this uh, combination uh, single inhaler. And just uh, uh, overall, if you look now, not at this one study, but at, uh, uh, again, a review and meta-analysis that was published in 2018, the combination uh, quick-acting and long-lasting beta agonist with an inhaled corticosteroid uh, compared to uh, inhaled steroid and a short-acting beta agonist, fewer exacerbations, but uh, no difference in symptom control, lung function, and differences in need for inhalation. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. This is the combination maintenance and reliever compared to combination as controller and carry your quick-acting albuterol as needed. Not necessary. You did just as well. In fact, fewer exacerbations if you use the one device. And potential side effects. Uh, uh, are you sure this is a good strategy? Um, I imagine that, uh, uh, you know, you've encountered patients on long-acting beta agonists who have complained of headaches, muscle cramps, occasional risk, I think, of tachyarrhythmias. Uh, in that occasional patient, I guess I would consider an inhaled steroid together with a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, and I look forward to the day when that's available in a single device. And then, of course, the issue of insurance coverage and cost, et cetera. But we're debating today uh, risks and benefit and uh, hope, hope that uh, insurance and payment, et cetera, would follow in a rational scientific basis. So I would like to conclude by saying I don't think there is a role for inhaled corticosteroids in alone in persistent asthma, including mild persistent asthma, because we have available combination inhalers, inhaled steroids, yes, with a long-acting beta agonist. They're more effective, uh, used um, in the way that we've described, a lower dose. We didn't mention this, I apologize, but a lower total dose of inhaled steroid uh, was administered. Um, they are equally safe compared to inhaled steroids alone, uh, and they promote uh, improved adherence uh, because of perceived benefit when used in this way. Well, that's what I'd like to say on behalf of combination therapy and against uh, um, inhaled steroids alone, but I would like to hear from Dr. Nancy Lang, who's going to present the counter-argument, yes, there is a role for the use of inhaled steroids. Dr. Lang. Thank you, Dr. Fanta. My name is Nancy Lang Vaidya, and I'm going to talk to you about why there is still a role for inhaled steroids alone in the treatment of asthma in some, in some cases. I first just wanted to say, as you know, we had to change our the time of the talk at the last minute. We just wanted to thank everyone for their flexibility uh, in allowing people in our community to observe uh, a peaceful protest for the sake of Black Lives Matter. And we hope it did not inconvenience anyone out there, but we felt it was important for everyone to be able to participate in this important event. I have no disclosures. We're so lucky here in, this, uh, in the Boston medical community to be among so many incredible uh, leaders in clinical medicine and in research. And as Isaac Newton once said, if I've seen further, it is only standing on the shoulders of giants, giants such as Dr. Chris Vanta himself. 
So you can imagine I was surprised when this same giant challenged me to a battle over whether or not inhaled steroids alone have a role in the treatment of mild asthma, and I had to, of course, accept. These are some abbreviations that I'm going to use in the talk that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, SAVA or short-acting beta agonist, LAVA or long-acting beta agonist, ICS or inhaled corticosteroid, and LTRA or leukotriene receptor antagonist. So we've come a long way since the 1800s when physicians used to give their asthma patients asthma cigarettes. And I think that most will agree that inhaled steroid treatment for asthma uh, is, was one of, the, one of the most important, if not the most important, developments in asthma treatment in the last 50 years. As Dr. Fanta mentioned, there was an association with decreased asthma mortality overall. In this study from the 1970s, you can see on the left, Many patients were controlled only on oral steroids for their asthma, and this study of patients transitioning from oral steroids to inhaled steroids showed that over 50% of them were able to come completely off of their oral steroids, which, of course, is beneficial in terms of much lower side effects. In addition, uh, even in mild asthma, as you can see in this study on the right, uh, inhaled steroids have been shown to significantly decrease exacerbations as compared to placebo or only as needed short-acting beta agonist. And inhaled steroids are, uh, as Dr. Fanta mentioned, have become really the mainstay of therapy for most of our patients with asthma. The addition of the long-acting beta agonist um, in the 90s and 2000s added a lot of benefits, especially in patients with moderate to severe asthma. As you can see in this study of lung function uh, over time, even the lower-dose steroid inhaler combined with long-acting beta agonist showed better lung function in these patients with moderate to severe asthma. They also showed decreased exacerbations, improved control of symptoms, improved lung function, as I mentioned, and there's a steroid sparing effect to the addition of the long-acting beta agonist. So the first scenario in which I would propose that it's reasonable to use inhaled steroids alone is in patients with mild persistent asthma, perhaps like the case that Dr. Fanta just presented. Now, the GINA guidelines, which many of you may be familiar with, up until 2018 recommended inhaled steroids alone um, for step two therapy, patients with mild persistent asthma, and to consider in patients uh, with mild intermittent asthma or step one therapy. But there's been a big shift in, this, uh, in these guidelines since 2019. The GINA guidelines have been updated, and they now recommend combination therapy as needed uh, as first line in patients with mild intermittent asthma, and in mild persistent asthma consideration of combination therapy as needed as well versus uh, steroids alone. I'm going to talk about several of the trials, uh, big trials published in the last couple of years that led to the shift in these guidelines. These include SIGMA 1 and 2 in mild and persistent asthma. This stands for Symbacort given as needed in mild asthma. The novel START study, which was mild intermittent and persistent asthma patients. This is novel Symbacort turbuhaler asthma reliever therapy. And the practical study, which was also in mild intermittent or persistent asthma. This stands for personalized asthma combination therapy with inhaled corticosteroid and fast onset long acting beta agonist. A little bit of a mouthful. So the SIGMA-1 study recruited close to 4,000 patients with mild persistent asthma. They were randomized to three different treatment arms, short-acting beta agonist as needed, steroids alone as maintenance therapy, and combination therapy as needed. It was placebo-controlled trial, so all patients, even on the as-needed therapy alone, were taking placebo uh, inhalers. And in terms of the exacerbation rate, as you can see in this figure, the blue represents the short-acting beta agonist alone, and the other two are the steroid-containing regimens, and both for severe and moderate to severe exacerbations, both steroid-containing regimens decreased, uh, were, were decreased significantly compared to short-acting beta agonist alone, but did not differ significantly from each other. The SIGMA-2 study was a non-inferiority trial of around 4,000 patients as well with mild persistent asthma. They were randomized to two different treatment regimens, just the steroid-containing regimens, inhaled steroids alone versus combination therapy as needed. And this was also a placebo-controlled trial. 
And similarly, there was no difference in the time to first exacerbation in either of the treatment arms. The novel START study was patients with mild intermittent or mild persistent asthma. Around 700 patients were randomized to three different treatment arms. The short-acting beta agonist as needed, steroids alone as maintenance therapy, or combination therapy as needed. And this was open label, so it was felt by the investigators to uh, mimic more of a real-world scenario. Patients who were only on intermittent therapy were not required to take maintenance placebo inhalers in addition. And similar findings, the short-acting beta agonist alone had higher rates of exacerbations, and both steroid-containing regimens had similar reduction in exacerbations that were significant compared to the short-acting beta agonist alone, but not significantly different from each other. And then finally, the fourth study, the practical study. This was around 900 patients. This was based in New Zealand. They all had mild asthma. Uh, they were randomized to two different treatment arms, either steroids alone as maintenance therapy or intermittent combination therapy. This was also an open-label study. And in this study, actually, there was a slightly um, improved rate of exacerbations in the intermittent combination therapy. So in summary, these studies show in mild asthma, looking at intermittent combination therapy versus steroids alone as maintenance treatment. They had similar or lower rates of exacerbations in combination therapy. There was a lower means daily steroid dose, and it was shown to be safe. There was no difference in adverse events. So you may wonder why I'm presenting these trials if my argument is that inhaled steroids alone are also reasonable, uh, is also a reasonable option for treatment in these patients. But I want to bring up some important points, which, um, which are, one, that uh, it's not clear that the benefits above the lower rates of exacerbations, the lower overall dose, um, are due to the long-acting beta agonist, uh, the addition of the long-acting beta agonist, or is it really due to a difference in approach to treatment, which is now uh, a newer approach that's that's becoming more, uh, more part of the guidelines for patients with mild or asthma. And more specifically, I'm talking about treating patients intermittently rather than with maintenance therapy and telling them to increase their inhaled steroids at a time of increased symptoms. So in terms of maintenance therapy for patients with mild asthma, this was uh, the, called the Optima study. This looked at patients with mild asthma. There were two different groups. Um, I'm showing the, the information from the mild asthma group. They were not necessarily on inhaled steroids within the last three months prior to the study. Um, and there were 700 patients in this part of the study. They were randomized to either placebo, so only as needed short-acting beta agonist, inhaled steroid maintenance alone or combination therapy maintenance alone. And looking at maintenance therapy, both the steroid-containing regimens did decrease exacerbation rates and improve symptom control as compared to placebo, but there was no significant difference for maintenance therapy um, between either exacerbation rates or symptom-free days. So for mild asthma, I think you could propose either combination therapy or inhaled steroid therapy if you're talking about maintenance therapy alone. Now, what about intermittent therapy? Prior to the studies that I discussed earlier, looking at combination and intermittent therapy, there have been also studies of intermittent steroids alone. This was the IMPACT trial uh, published in 2005. They looked at 200 patients with mild persistent asthma, and these patients were randomized to inhaled steroids alone as maintenance, inhaled steroids alone as needed, or a leukotriene receptor antagonist, cefirlocast. Now, their primary endpoint was peak flow, a difference in peak flow variability between the beginning and the end of the study, and they did not find significant differences between the two steroid-containing regimens. But they also did look at exacerbation rates, and there was no difference in exacerbation rates between maintenance therapy with steroids alone or maintenance, or uh, excuse me, as needed therapy with steroids alone. So I think these may have uh, been in part a foundation for the more recent studies looking at combination therapy as needed, but I think that this, this proves, um, or at least proves the concept that intermittent therapy with inhaled steroids, whether alone or in combination with long-acting beta agonists, are beneficial in patients with milder asthma. This was the BEST trial, uh, also looking at intermittent therapy in patients with mild persistent asthma. 
They recruited uh, 450 patients, and there were four different treatment arms, short-acting beta agonist alone. There was combination therapy of inhaled steroids with short-acting beta agonist as needed, maintenance therapy with steroids alone, or maintenance therapy with combination therapy. And once again, the primary endpoint of the study was peak flow, which they did not find a significant difference. And when they looked at exacerbations, both the um, the intermittent and the maintenance therapy had similar rates of exacerbations. So looking at intermittent steroids alone in mild asthma, we do have to take some caution in the trials that I mentioned because they are smaller trials than the ones I discussed earlier, and exacerbations were not the primary outcome. Um, but I think they, they show and demonstrate that the, there are benefits to intermittent therapy with steroids. They showed similar exacerbation rates to maintenance therapy and a lower overall steroid dose similar to combination therapy when used intermittently. Therefore, I think that in, in, inhaled steroids alone can be used either intermittently or as maintenance therapy for patients with mild asthma. Looking a bit closer at the novel START study, you might remember this is the patients with mild intermittent or mild persistent asthma, and they were randomized to short-acting beta agonist alone, intermittent combination therapy, or steroid maintenance therapy. As I had said earlier, their primary outcome of exacerbation rates were no different between the two steroid-containing regimens and were both uh, significantly better than short-acting beta agonist alone. And this was actually a composite outcome when you look at the number of severe exacerbations, which was defined as requiring oral steroids for an asthma exacerbation, there was a significantly lower rate in the as-needed combination therapy as compared to inhaled steroid maintenance. And I think this brings up the second aspect of the approach to treatment, not just intermittent therapy, but telling patients to increase their doses of inhaled steroids at the time of symptoms when you look at the breakdown of the, of the primary outcome, um, the darkest column here is the number of severe exacerbations or those requiring oral steroids. And the lightest, they also used high use episode as, uh, as a part of the definition of exacerbation. So you can see that in the patients instructed to increase their inhaled steroids at the time of increased symptoms, they, they may have been preventing these severe exacerbations uh, that required oral steroids, and just exactly this approach has been looked at with, oral st with inhaled steroids alone. So a second scenario in which I would propose inhaled steroids alone are reasonable to use as, is as add-on therapy to prevent an exacerbation that ends up requiring oral steroids. This study that was published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at exactly that, quadrupling the inhaled steroid dose in order to abort asthma exacerbations. They recruited adults with asthma that were on any dose of inhaled steroid, and quite a few of these patients already were on combination therapy with ICS lava, 70%. They had almost 2,000 patients in the study, and they had to have had an at least one exacerbation in the last year. Patients were either instructed to use their as-needed short-acting beta agonist or to quadruple their inhaled steroids at the time of increased symptoms. And the quadrupling group saw a lower uh, significant significantly lower rate of severe exacerbations, and that included lower, uh, lower need for oral steroids as well as lower hospitalizations for asthma. So although the updated guidelines recommend combination therapy as needed, which is supported by several recent large studies that I reviewed, I think that the approach to treatment in mild asthma may be more important than whether it's combination therapy or inhaled steroids alone and specifically inter using the steroids intermittently and instructing patients to increase their dose of inhaled steroids at the time of increased symptoms. It's possible, I, I concede that the addition of the rapid onset long-acting beta, beta agonist does improve compliance and certainly it does make people feel better and uh, I, I think it's reasonable to use either one in this scenario. I don't know if there's a trial right now of inhaled steroids alone versus uh, combination therapy, both used intermittently, um, but that could answer that question, certainly. And I do think it's important to point out that several of those studies were funded by um, AstraZeneca, who, who makes Simbacort, and so we always need to take that into consideration in the interpretation of the study. Okay, moving on to... Uh, other outcomes in asthma. Certainly, clinicians and patients agree that 
preventing asthma exacerbations is one of our main goals in asthma therapy. But what about patients who are really more bothered by symptoms and are not really the type of patients who end up with exacerbations requiring oral steroids? As I mentioned earlier, the Optima study looking at mild persistent asthma, um, comparing maintenance therapy of inhaled steroids alone versus combination therapy and maintenance did not show any significant difference in uh, symptom control between these two regimens when they're used as maintenance therapy. And when we look closer at the trials of intermittent combination therapy, it does look like steroids alone as maintenance therapy may improve symptom control. In the novel START study, one of the secondary outcomes was the symptom score as assessed by the asthma control questionnaire. And this uh, showed a significant improvement in the patients who were on inhaled steroids alone, more so than patients on intermittent combination therapy, and both of those more than the short-acting beta agonist alone. In the SIGMA-1 study, this was the one with the three treatment arms as well. In fact, the primary outcome was weeks of well-controlled asthma, and there was a significant difference, as you can see in this figure, the, the top um, dotted line in, in kind of a grayish color is the percent of weeks with well-controlled asthma on steroids alone, as opposed to on the short-acting beta agonist alone or as-needed combination therapy. So it does look like for symptom control, it's possible that the approach of maintenance therapy with inhaled steroids alone may be superior. In the SIGMA-2 study, which was the non-inferiority trial of the two steroid-containing regimens, similar findings in terms of improved symptom control on steroids alone. And in the practical study, although overall in the cohort there was no difference in symptom control, there was in the subgroup of patients with higher eosinophils a trend towards improved symptoms on the steroid alone containing regimen. And in the novel START study, there was a lower uh, fractional ex exhaled nitric oxide, which we know is associated with eosinophilic inflammation in the airways in patients who are on the steroids alone. So in the ongoing uh, struggle that we have of trying to predict who will respond to which therapies better, possibly patients who, uh, by history, have more symptoms than exacerbations, and perhaps maybe our mild patients who have uh, higher type 2 inflammation may respond better to steroid maintenance. So that will be the third on the list of the times when I would suggest that it would be reasonable to use inhaled steroids alone. Now, what about genetic risk factors? Well, after the, the other SMART trial, not the SMART trial that Dr. Fanta mentioned, but the one um, of salmeterol, which uh, suggested there may be an increased risk of death in patients on long-acting beta agonists, there were several studies trying to help figure out who may be at, at increased risk of death. And in this study, they were looking for rare variants in the beta adrenergic receptor gene to see if there were uh, rare variants that were associated with increased rat asthma death or poor or negative asthma outcomes uh, while on long-acting beta agonist therapy. They sequenced the gene in several different populations, African Americans, non-Hispanic whites, and Puerto Ricans with asthma. They identified six rare variants uh, in these groups, and then they genotyped in a larger group and replicated in another population. They did find two rare variants that were associated with poor asthma outcomes. One was in non-Hispanic white patients and another in African-American patients. And they found patients with the rare allele of this, uh, of this variant in those two populations, if they were on long-acting beta agonist therapy, had higher risk of asthma-related hospitalizations, urgent visits for asthma care. Uh, they had higher risk of needing systemic steroids for their asthma, poorer asthma control, and higher short-acting beta agonist use. And this was compared to patients with that variant non, not on long-acting beta agonists, as well as patients who did not have that variant at all. But this is, these are rare, which is they were looking for rare variants in the study, and they are rare, so it's hard to know how clinically applicable it is. The, the investigators mentioned in order to prevent one hospital admission during long-acting beta agonist treatment in one year, it would require genotyping 150 non-Hispanic whites and 100 African Americans, and the population attributable risk of this uh, these rare variants is very low. But I would argue that with an overall prevalence of 7%, um, this is something that warrants further investigation, although it's not something we can implement in our clinical practice currently. So 
another scenario in which you might use inhaled steroids alone are patients with these rare variants. Now, generally speaking, long-acting beta agonists are safe, as Dr. Fanta mentioned, although there are patients who have allergies or intolerance. It's uncommon to have an allergy or true hypersensitivity to long-acting beta agonists, but it is possible. Um, and some people do, especially with the more rapid onset for motorol, have more of the cardiac effects similar to the short-acting beta agonists that they find intolerable, whether it's tachycardia, palpitations, or arrhythmia in patients who may be prone to this, or a tremor, as Dr. Fanta had mentioned. So here's another, uh, another one on the list that you would use inhaled steroids alone is someone who has an allergy or intolerance tolerance to the long-acting beta agonist. And probably the least scientifically interesting, but possibly one of the more clinically relevant reasons is cost or insurance coverage. We all know it's been way too long to get generics of many of the asthma inhalers, although there is now one of the combination uh, inhalers is available as a generic. But I'm sure I'm not the only one who's tried to write my patient for a combination inhaler and then been told they have to try three other inhalers first or and fail them before I can get the one that I think is most appropriate for them. Of course, we... We hope and expect that insurance companies and insurance coverage will catch up with our scientific evidence and our scientific-based recommendations, but the reality is sometimes our patients don't get the inhalers that we want them to get, and this can be a real issue, especially if you're prescribing combination inhaler in mild or asthmatics. So in summary, times when I think it is a reasonable option to use inhaled steroids alone include patients with mild asthma. I think you could use either combination therapy or inhaled steroids alone as add-on therapy for patients who may already be on a combination inhaler or not to prevent needing oral steroids. Patients maybe who have more symptoms than um, exacerbations, and perhaps these are the more type 2 high type mild asthmatics. Um, but this warrants further investigation. Patients with the rare, these certain rare variants of the beta adrenergic receptor, any patient with an allergy or intolerance to a long-acting beta agonist, and then, of course, patients who may not be able to afford the combination inhalers. So thank you for your time. I just thought I'd show a picture of my office set up in the pandemic scenario here, and we'd be happy to discuss any questions or further points. That was terrific. <laughs> that was very good. Very convincing. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, uh, we welcome uh, questions. I'm going to put that phone number up uh, or the texting number up in case anybody wants to text us a question. But uh, Nancy, can I ask you, what are you going to send my young lady home with? After her visit, remember she uh, was using her albuterol a lot. She's now living with the parents the and the cat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, wh wh what's your, uh, you know, step care approach? What are, what are you going to give her? What are you going to send her home on? I think in a patient like that, I might give her the options. I would, I would consider, I would consider it reasonable to try either combination therapy intermittently for her or steroids alone as maintenance, and I may discuss with her the, the benefits of, of one versus the other. She may, fit, she may fit the bill of the kind of patient who's more of a regular symptoms patient rather than someone who has a lot of exacerbations. So I think she may do well on inhaled steroids as maintenance alone. But if she prefers using an intermittent combination therapy, I think that's also reasonable. I think either approach uh, is reasonable in that patient, but I don't think there's one right answer. Um, the intermittent inhaled steroids alone for mild asthma mm -hmm. had evidence of uh, no increase in exacerbations, and, <clears throat> and we suspect that patients do, do that. that anyway, right, because right, right. they stop their inhaled steroid when they're feeling well. Right. What I worry about is explaining what I meant by intermittent when I give instructions. Mm -hmm. what, what is it that you're going to tell the patient about when she should or shouldn't or can or doesn't use her inhaled steroids so she doesn't get confused and think it's just like the albuterol, a couple of puffs is needed? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think that's a good point, and I think it's also a question when you use intermittent combination therapy because 
I've had patients ask me how many times a day can I use this inhaler, and we typically, for for you know for budesonide for motorol, for example, we typically give it twice a day, and to tell patients they can use it up to eight eight to ten times a day feels a little bit uncomfortable, although that is what they did in the trials. So, um, I think you would have to. to I, I think you have to kind of decide on an interval that you think makes sense, and I would explain it to them that it's almost like a loading dose of something that should get their their symptoms under control within the next 24 to 48 hours. So in the first 24 hours, I might say it would be reasonable to use every six hours, something like that, um, but not to expect it to make them feel better immediately or even, you know, within that first 24-hour period. But I think it, it is hard to, to know how to explain it, and certainly the simplicity of the combination inhalers is appealing. I think that because the studies were only done with the, the formoterol combination, it's hard to know if they get that same benefit in the, in the once-a-day long-acting beta agonist or the, you know, the cell meterol, which is not as fast of an onset. So. How fair. would you tell your patient? It, it is fair to uh, <laughs> mention that formoterol comes combined with uh, mometasone right. as well as another alternative combination. Right. It's just the studies seem all right. based on the budesonide formoterol combination. Right. One last question, for you, if you don't <laughs> mind. Uh, uh, so now they're feeling worse and they need to uh, in increase their dose of inhaled corticosteroid quadruple their dose of inhaled corticosteroid. What, what do you tell them? How, how do so they do that? So I think that, that what's, what's tricky about that study is there had been prior studies that showed that doubling the dose of the inhaled steroid did not uh, result in preventing, re preventing exacerbation. So I think if you're going to take that approach, then you really do need to quadruple it. But I do think, as I had pointed out in the novel START study, those patients didn't necessarily quadruple their inhaled steroids, but just their natural inclination to use their steroids as needed for symptoms because it was the combination therapy. They 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 increased their their dose kind of in the way that was, I guess, necessary to decrease the the need for oral steroids. So I think if they were on steroids alone, I might tell them to quadruple their dose for a couple of days and see if it helps them turn around. If it was combination therapy, you might just continue to tell them to use it as needed for, for shortness of breath, for, for symptoms, and, and hope that they sort of self-medicate the right amount to, to turn themselves around. What would your approach be, Dr. Fenta? Uh, I'm going to give my young lady combination inhaler. I'm going to ask her to start taking it on a regular basis, and I anticipate that we'll e e either be able to uh, decrease the dose uh, with time or once-a-day dosing or maybe even a PRN uh, uh, approach. But I think she's going to feel, I, I, for her maintenance therapy, I'm going to ask her to use an inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta agonist. I do have some thoughtful comments. Can I just read the text that people have sent in? Uh, uh, um, insurance companies won't change until the FDA changes their approval. And I think that's, uh, that is certainly true. And then uh, there's a comment that the long-term asthma outcomes, loss of lung function, going from mild to moderate and severe asthma, hasn't been evaluated in this PRN inhaled steroids or PRN LABA ICS studies. And by treating with PRN, we are missing the boat. Those patients who have more symptoms are at increase of worse asthma. We cannot neglect adherence and confusion, and that's the purpose of asthma education. Mm -hmm. And um, one comment about uh, keep in mind that you can't confuse inhaled steroid salmeterol for inhaled steroid for motorol because of the distinct time of onset. Mm -hmm. And please discuss concerns about the use of combination versus inhaled steroids alone in the elderly versus children and any gender differences. I think most of the studies have included, or many of the studies have included children. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, this is, uh, I don't think there's evidence of 
harm in children or adverse outcomes. Elderly is an interesting question because of increased risk of cardiac disease, and I can't say that I know of studies specifically. Uh, and any gender differences, I do not know of any. Uh, and then a comment that even a five-fold, you remember the study, a five-fold increase in the dose of inhaled steroids didn't prove effective in the pediatric population. Mm -hmm. We're two o'clock. I think we probably should stop. I thank you for these uh, wonderful, thoughtful comments. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again in September. And thank you, Nancy. <laughs>